Tom Matuska here with Brett Wingfield, camera lady Kate, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> we're here for the Matuska Taxidermy um, Supply Company Live, and uh, back to our walleye project. And I think if you uh, joined us last week, and were we on like seven last week, I I'm going to say we're so, dragging yeah. this out a while, but good taxidermy work cannot be rushed. And uh, I mean, it's, it's kind of painstaking, it really is. And to do a good job, um, we can't show you how to do a good job and rush through it. So apologize for probably the next three. We may have three <laughs> more, but when we get done, um, I think we're going to have a, a far, far, far superior above commercial walleye mount mm -hmm. on a beautiful wall display. And um, you can start all the way back from the beginning in our archives on either YouTube or our Matuska Facebook um, live sessions. And uh, just go to the, I think it's just called, what's it called? Um, so it starts with part one or whatever the designated part was, and then it's mounting a walleye. Mounting a walleye, A to Z, right? Yes. Yeah. And so uh, it doesn't matter if it's a walleye, a large mouth, small mouth. Yeah. Um, we basically treat them all the same. It's uh, measurements, reference material, skin mm -hmm. the fish, do a good job of skinning and fleshing, treating the skin, making a body. Um, the process is the same. It doesn't matter if it's a little bitty bluegill or it's a great big you know, northern pike. Uh, the steps are all the same. Some of them are a little bit more involved depending on what kind of fish that you happen to be doing. So um, feel free to go back and they're all mm -hmm. free for the viewing and, and go back and watch these things. I think you'll learn a lot. And uh, um, we're going to just kind of proceed today. Last week, I think if you joined us, um, I think you showed them how to rebuild the bottom of the jaw. Yep. And mm -hmm. um, as we've said several times through the um, series here, when you mount a skin mounted fish, um, there's a lot of shrink encountered. Now, mm -hmm. some people do not deal with rebuilding any shrink at all. I mean, there's taxidermists that, that don't mess with that. Um, there are taxidermists that do what we call hybrid mounts, where they use yeah. artificial heads, even on their, I call them warm water fish, like their walleyes, mm -hmm. large mouth, small mouth, they'll actually use artificial heads, which is an excellent, excellent method um, Anything that you do comes with its own set of problems, I would say. Yes. Um, if you use an artificial head, you got to be able to attach that head so a year down the road mm -hmm. you don't encounter a crack. Um, use an artificial head, you have to be a little bit gifted in painting that to match the skin. Yeah. Um, if you use the real skin, you have to have a little bit of, be a little bit crafty rebuilding the top of the head because there's a whole lot of shrink. Um, you have to be able to rebuild the bottom of the jaw. There's a whole lot of shrink. Um, just a lot of variables depending on your method sure. that you're going to be using. Anytime that you rebuild something, you want to compare it to, you know, as close to a live specimen as you can get. Um, this was a, we used to have written on here um, on one of our walleye casts that he was uh, molded live. Um, I think it said nearly live because yeah. um, he was deceased for, I would say, a minute and a half before we um, pulled the, poured the gel trade <laughs> over him. I'm not sure what we did. But uh, anyway, you want something very, very fresh. Don't make a mold of, you know, for instance, something that's been dried up on the beach for yeah. a long time. You want them very, very fresh. Another thing that is very helpful, and I say this over and over, is um, a fish out of the freezer, a real good mm -hmm. fresh specimen that hasn't been in the freezer for years and years, um, that was wrapped well, um, spray the slime off with the water and, and uh, lay it here when you're doing the rebuilds. It's yeah. very helpful to look at the real fish. And you can feel on the real thawed fish, you can feel what's bone and what's cartilage and what's, what's fleshy and what's Shoot. meaty. And then you can look at your mounted fish and you can go, wow, no wonder that shrunk in so much. You know, it's just nothing but meat there. Um, a lot of this is places where 
a taxidermist can't really skin out, you know. So, sure. so get those areas. Um, some people skin farther than others. The farther you skin, the more odors you eliminate, the more meat you eliminate that's gonna attract bugs and cause odors. So you wanna skin them out as far as you can, but there's just places you can't get. So you're gonna to wanna to have good reference material. You're gonna to wanna to spend the time and get real creative um, copying what you see. Um, just you know, rebuild what you see. Use your calipers. Um, just kind of realize what's shrinking and what's not and what you have to do. So we did that last week. You set eyes, um, and mm -hmm. I think we went over a little bit of a little bit of eyes. There's um, Tohican has a good um, selection of yeah. uh, glass fish eyes, um, aqua eyes by Dan Reinhardt. Um, we've got flex eyes. We've used flex eyes for years and years and years. Um, Jeff Lumps, so we've painted live our own, eyes. Yeah. You can paint your own. Um, that's something we don't do enough of, and I really, I enjoy it a little bit too much mm -hmm. because um, when we started painting fish eyes, it is, it's so fun. Yeah. And you paint a little bit and you turn them over to see what it looks like. You paint a little bit and you'll come up with a system and it's, I, I really enjoy painting yeah. fish eyes so much so that I don't get the fish <laughs> finished. Um, so uh, there's, uh, Live eyes, there's all kinds of different eyes on the market. Um, a lot of people have, are using the, the eyes from Croatia. Um, Tyler mm -hmm. Erickson has a selection of eyes. Yeah. There's, there's lots of good fish eyes out there. So anyway, we kind of showed you how to set the eyes and look back. We talked a little bit about angles and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. We sealed the fish and uh, we were using Cretex paints. We have um, morphed, I guess. We have kind of yeah. um, transferred yeah. from lacquers. We've used lacquers for 40 years. years. You haven't. Yeah. I have for Half a long, long time. <laughs> and lacquers have served us very, very well and um, are a great, great paint. And um, we are now using Createx paints. And the, one of the best parts of the Createx paints is a sealer. And mm -hmm. anytime we get a sealer, we've used lacquer sealers for years and um, premium fish sealer we carry, mm -hmm. base coat sealer, a lot of good sealers. You want to seal your fish skin prior to painting. And um, when we got a Createx paint, um, we had a whole selection of trial paints. This is a 6,000 transparent sealer. Um, make yeah. sure that you get the transparent sealer. It comes in white, comes in gray, might even come in a black. black. Yep. Um, and these are mostly for the automotive industry, I think. Yep. So be careful and make sure that when, because this comes out of the out of the little jar here, it comes out snow white, white. like Elmer's glue. And if it happened to be the white, you can't tell the white yeah. from the transparent. Anyway, you paint it on and it gave us an exceptional, exceptional surface to paint on. I, I, that's probably one of my my favorite sealers of all time is the um, transparent sealer by Createx. And even if you use lacquers, lacquers will adhere to this. It works just yeah. fine. Um, whatever kind of paint that you're gonna use, um, I think you'll like the 6000 transparent sealer. It's a little bit thicker than our lacquer thealer, sealer. Our lacquer sealer. <laughs> um, our lacquer sealer. Um, <laughs> Uh, dried down and and shrunk up. I always liked it because you mm -hmm. never had to worry about runs. You yeah. could brush it on and I think it evaporated into a very thin film. Um, the Createx sealer gives you a little bit, evens out the surfaces, I think. It, it um, your, cor your scales are not quite as coarse. So give that a try, we like that. Um, then, uh, getting ready to paint, I think we're going to uh, uh, you want to do something with the eyes. A lot of people mm -hmm. scratch eyes off, like they'll they'll paint the whole fish and then they'll take either a, a scalpel or a Q-tip with lacquer thinner or some mm. tool and they will clean the eye lens off. Um, I don't like scratching my plastic eyes. We use a lot of acrylic eyes. Um, we don't like scratching them, even though your gloss will hide that, I think, most of the time. But uh, we've always uh, used either eye protect. Yeah or iFrisket, both good products. Um, we still use them on our game heads and things like that, 
but um, you just take a, they're kind of a rubber product and you just take a brush kind of like this, dip it in there, you know, put it around. Yeah. We've even used um, Q-tips. You can get really good with a Q-tip, coax the rubber around the perimeter. Try not to get it on the lid. If you used Fix-It Sculpt, hand me that little walleye there that yeah. you've got going. Um, if you used Fix-It Sculpt like we did on this, and you get your eye protect or whatever kind of a protection for the eye up on that fix it sculpt, you're gonna paint the whole fish. When you peel it off, you're gonna have white around there. Yep. And we've tried coloring our, our fixatives, our magic sculpts, our epoxy sculpts, all that. We've tried coloring them, and when we color them, um, the color sometimes doesn't match what you started with. Yeah. Uh, adding color to your epoxies is Difficult. Tricky, yeah. Difficult to match. And Caitlin has something for us. Yes, we've got a few people tuning in. We've got Tara Hubner who says, oh, hey, hi, hey, Tara. Time. We've got Douglas Kowal who says, hi, guys, you're doing an awesome thing for everyone <laughs> by doing live videos for the beginners, like how in-depth you all are. We've got Dustin Baker tuning in. Darren Nye from Cornell, Wisconsin says, finally, first time getting on to see the live. Thanks for all the information and fast <laughs> delivery of supplies. You guys are awesome. And then we've got Larry Wiggins, Christopher Burklass, and Lucas Stores. Christopher. Hi. Wow. Still got my Swiss Army knife, Christopher. <laughs> uh, Buchanan saying hello. If you've got comments, questions, anything. Yeah, let us know and we'll, we'll try in. to answer them. It kind of, everybody learns from the questions. And That's right. The only problem is you're question that you think is really, really dumb, your name's it's attached the... to it. So. <laughs> but we will answer them. Um, no question is a silly question. We answer them all. Um, but uh, um, we're going to take clay is what the easiest thing. And I think mm -hmm. um, we've always painted on the rubber. And it's you got to go get the the rubber, you gotta get a good brush to put it on with. You gotta be, you gotta clean your eye real good. Yeah. You gotta be really careful putting it on. And we've used clay for, or I mean, we've used uh, any of the rubbers, eye frisket or, um, you know. Eye protect. Eye yeah. protect all the time and for years, but we kinda, I don't know, saw in a taxidermy today um, <laughs> tips and tricks or something by Larry Goldman, probably, I don't know, <laughs> sure. Um, but we use oil-based clay. Oil-based clay is super fast and very easy. And um, I'm just, I just took a, we just have a little thing over on the paint table, a little gob of oil-based clay. You don't have to wrap it up, it never hardens. Um, tear off a little chunk, get it good and warm in your hands. You want it nice and warm. And the warmer it is, the better it's gonna spread. And I'm just gonna take a, a little gob of clay, it works best if you clean your eye really, really good. Take some alcohol or fine, fine, fine steel wool or whatever you want to clean your eyes with. Clean them first because when you take this clay off, the fish is going to be all painted and he can be ready for glass. Then you don't have to worry about getting any thinners on, on the fish itself. So I take a little bit, roll it out into a bigger than a pea a tiny little cherry. <laughs> That'd be a little one. And I just push it on the middle and then watching careful, I can just with my thumb or fingers push it up to the edge of the epoxy sculpt or fix it sculpt, whatever you happen to use. And it doesn't have to be real neat in the middle. You don't, you're not striving for any kind of a shape. You're just trying to cover, in this case, the acrylic eye with clay. I'm not trying to get any up onto my fix-it sculpt because I will leave a white halo around the eye set. And it's just fast and easy, you know, I'm basically done here. Now I can paint that fish and um, I couldn't have even gotten, gone and gotten my 
brush to paint on the rubbers by now. So that's how we treat our eyes. Um, it comes off, it's going to leave a little clay residue. Just take a little paper towel, wipe it off, and it's good to go. Um, works good for us. We don't, we don't do this on the, the deer and the mammals, but it works pretty good on fish. So there's the eye protected. Now we can paint this entire fish. This incidentally is called a, a in this case, it's called a gob of clay on the eye. Oh. <laughs> but for art purposes, it's a frisket. Um, just like a eye frisket is something that you protect something with. You can yeah. airbrush over this whole fish. Peel, you know, if you had the rubber, you just grab a hold of it and peel it right off, and it's called a frisket, and it protected. Um, welcome everybody uh, for tuning in and holy smokes I hope I hope you don't have to read all the names of the people from last week because we had yeah, 20 were... some thousand people you? yeah you yes. are a lot of you I, I think they just know what kind of quality <laughs> production this is and <laughs> word spreads like crazy because it was a lot it was, it was a lot it was a lot um okay we're gonna delve into painting a little bit today mm -hmm. and um We'll get started on this fish and carry it on into next week, I think. Oh, yeah. um, go over the glossing, and then after that, I think it's onto a nice piece of uh, wood and rock yep. habitat, and we're going to turn him into a work of art. Yeah, wrap him up and put him out in the showroom. And you should be getting kind of excited. When you um, mount the fish, you're going to know. If you, did, if you did good, if everything's balanced, your symmetry's good, you're going to set your eyes, build up the buildups on the top of the head. You should be getting more and more excited as you go because yeah. he's going to look fishier and fishier and fishier if you did a good yes. job. And if something goes wrong with your buildups with your epoxies, there's nothing stopping you from taking a grinder and grinding off what you did and mm -hmm. redoing it. We, we have redone more tax to me work. Yeah. I have redone more taxidermy work oh, yeah. than I have ever done right the first time. Yeah. Um, so don't be afraid to do things over. Um, I, have, I have got a fish mounted before, and I've taken a knife and cut the stitches in the back and started over from scratch. Mm -hmm. um, don't be afraid to do that. You want to be happy yeah. with it. You want a happy customer. This business is not fun if you don't have happy customers. And so if something doesn't make you thrilled, it might not make your customer happy either. So don't be... Yeah. Um, yes, you're going to waste a lot of time and, and you're going to feel like you're not getting paid for it. This one you might not, but it's going to improve your work overall. Okay, a couple things um, before we get started. Um, airbrushes, we're going to touch on airbrushes a little bit. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to just give you a, a real quick rundown here. This is, um, I've got the least expensive airbrushes to some of the more expensive airbrushes. Um, this is a Pache single action um, H airbrush. This airbrush is um, adjusts. It's a single action means the only thing the trigger gives you is air. You push down, that's all you get, air. But the air comes through this tube and the suction from the air going past sucks paint out of either a bottle or a little color cup. Very, very simple operation. Very easy to clean, and we see a lot of people um, graduating up from this airbrush. They start out with an H airbrush, which is, I think, the airbrush alone is still in the $40 range or less. And uh, they end up going to a two, dollars $300 airbrush only to have trouble after trouble after trouble when this is a great, great, great piece of mm -hmm. equipment. Um, mo many, many, many taxidermists start out with this, and we still have 16 of them behind us yep. hooked up hooked up on uh, air hoses. Uh, great airbrush, easy to clean, very simple to use, and it can give you exceptional results used properly. Um, I always tell people that I'll be at a show, and, and you might see somebody who, um, best in the world, person in whatever category, ducks or fish or, or whatever, and 
you, you, right away, you want to be like them. I want to be like that guy. And you go up and you say, what do you use for an airbrush? You know, thinking he's going to give you the magic, magic, magic potion, you know. And he'll say, oh, I use a, you know, Pache H. Go, what? That's a $40 airbrush. You're like God to me, and you're using a $40 airbrush? <laughs> this will do it. These yeah. little guys will do it. Um, it's more in the person doing it rather than the piece of equipment. Um, another single action airbrush is an Iwata. This is a great little um, airbrush. It's uh, an Iwata SAR, single action airbrush are the initials. And this one you adjust by turning the back barrel collar instead of up in the front like the Pache. Um, and I wouldn't doubt these are not very much over $100. Good airbrush, very, very, very high quality single action airbrush. Great piece of equipment. Um, when you get into the double action airbrushes, um, there's, Pache has, has two or three of them, I think, that, that work really good. And um, this is a VL that's been around. My very first airbrush was a Pache VL. I didn't know how to use it. Um, I used oil paints and thinned them the best I could. Um, I had a compressor of my dad's that blew more oil than it did air, and I never got my first Pache ever to work. I think I finally wrecked it, letting paint dry up in it. Um, this is a, a good entry-level single-action airbrush. Um, Pache has some really nice um, equipments. The equipment, this is a, a Raptor. I think I also have... A, What's the um, gold one? Do you know what that was called? That's a mm, not the Millennium. Um, I got a Millennium too. Yeah, we've got an abundance of airbrushes. Um, uh, a double action airbrush gives you air by pushing down on the trigger, and it gives you paint by pulling back. You don't have to continually adjust anything in the front or the back. The paint comes out by how far you pull the trigger back. Um, a lot of the double action airbrushes have. A governor, I call it a governor, it's mm -hmm. back here. You can turn this down till it closes and that'll only allow you to pull your trigger back so far. Say you're making spots or you want to keep your line quality the same thickness. Push down, pull back, and this stops you from pulling back too far. Say we want to spray a lot of paint, we're going to open that up. Now we can spray a lot. Yep. Is um, that other one a talon? Talon, yeah. yeah. The gold talon. Yep. And it's kind of, a lot. all of these airbrushes work really well we i don't think we have any of the airbrushes we've used that you could say just don't work it's kind of what what do you like for feel yeah um, this feels nice it's tapered yeah. nice the weight is nice um, some of the airbrushes on the market are a little bit too heavy um, yeah. you had a what was it that your first airbrush that you had what was that there's a Pache, the one you Pache, showed me. Pache, yeah, the F. F. Yeah. And that was a little guy. A little. Tiny they don't make it anymore. Thing, I've yeah. never seen it for a long time. Yep. Um, little bitty guy. Yeah. We've got Andy Jacobs who says painting his favorite part, and then yeah. we've got Cole Cruikshank who oh, says oh, nice oh, tip no. with the oil clay. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Learned it from you. <laughs> uh, um, and this is then you get into a little more expensive an airbrush. Um, the Iwata airbrushes, we like I, the Iwatas mm -hmm. and Pache's and, and uh, Badgers, we like all of them, but um, typically my go-to today, it'll change next week, <laughs> but uh, this is a Iwata C, double action, push down for air, pull back for the amount of paint you want. It's got a governor back here. And I think you use a lot um, the custom Micron, mm -hmm. and a custom like Micron, Micron is is one of Iwata's high-end airbrushes. Um, I'm not very good at taking care of my equipment. I'm, my wife will say, oh, really? <laughs> and, but uh, so for me to leave something really bad in my cup and let it harden up to where it's never gonna work again is my style. So if I'm gonna let that happen, I'm way better off with a, <laughs> lesser valuable airbrush than a high-end airbrush. But um, that's just some of the airbrushes that we mm -hmm. have in the shop. And, and uh, if you ever want to talk airbrushes, call. We'll visit with you oh, anytime. Yeah. We do that in a, um, do that daily, you know, almost. Yeah. And there's right lots here. of, um, 
when an airbrush doesn't work for you, it's almost always human air. Mm -hmm. um, it's too much air, too little air, too thin a paint, too thick a paint. Um, yep. A dirty airbrush, you know, it's almost always human air. Yep. Okay, um, we brushed upon airbrushes a little bit. What you got? Craig Metz is wondering, with the wide variety of walleye eyes out there, do you give your customers options or do you have a specific eye you normally use? We like to make our eyes. We think we get a better realistic. You, get a nice you eye. know, a walleye, yeah. a walleye eye is so subjective because you, uh, is that a good word? Mm -hmm. uh, because, because in the middle of the day, sun shining, you catch a walleye, you look at him, his eye is as black as a largemouth bass. You know, it's yeah. nothing more than a black pupil. Your pupil is a hole. It's yeah. not, it's not a black spot on your iris. So um, middle of the day, they look black. So if you mounted a walleye with a regular dark pupiled eye, there's Perfectly, nothing wrong with yeah. that. It's very realistic. Um, you got your waders on, you're wading at night with your little headlamp and you catch a walleye, man, yeah. the eyes are just shooting right back at you. They're yeah. reflecting back that, that light. Um, so a lot of people want a, a pearly eye. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the eye companies make some pretty nice representation of walleye eyes. Mm -hmm. um, as a little boy, I, my dad would clean fish and I would cut apart walleye <laughs> eyes. And that's how I ever came to make our walleye mm -hmm. eyes like we do. But anyway, um, we tend to make them. We put a lot of effort into our walleye eyes. Mm -hmm. And so you're gonna have to have some examples of um, on your wall for your customers. I remember when I first got into taxidermy, um, I went to the Minnesota taxidermy I don't think there was a guild at that time, and Jerry Schaefer was kind of oh, running yeah. it. And I had been a taxidermist for 15 minutes and thought I was kind of God's gift to taxidermy <laughs> at that time. And I walked in there and I saw a little walleye about 16 inches long mounted, and it had the best eye I had ever seen. And Jerry had made it using tin foil in a clear lens. Oh. And I don't remember, I never, got the real recipe, but it was almost like he had rolled a ball of tin foil, put it behind a glass eye, and it was exceptionally realistic. Huh. And uh, Jerry Schaefer is a pioneer in taxidermy. He's been around forever and uh, is the developer of the New Angle Bird Flesher. Yeah. And I think he's out of Madison Lake, Minnesota. And the taxidermy shop book for a yep. long time. Oh, taxidermy yeah. shop book. He had several yeah. books and and uh, quite a flat, flat artist also. Mm -hmm. Okay, now let's talk about paint. Um, like I said, we've used lacquers forever and ever and ever and done very, very mm -hmm. well with lacquers. Um, got a great big exhaust fan in the wall that sucks all of our fumes out. And um, I have tried, this is my own story, I've tried water-based paints or acrylics mm -hmm many, many, many times. I have tried tried them all, starting with uh, um, Wasco's, you know, the, the are they FTs or something like that? Yeah, something like that. I can't remember. Um, Wasco came out with a water version to their, um, to theirs. And then Lifetone came out with Hydromist and tried them all. And every time I do, I buy hundreds of dollars of paint convinced. I don't care what it takes, I'm gonna make this work. And uh, I was never able to. I went through four at least um, brands of water-based yep. paint. Never, never was able to do it. Um, and it wasn't until I've told the story several times, but wasn't until um, about three years ago, Mandy mm -hmm. was talking to Craig, Chad Elliott from um, the Sharpen Air yep. that sharpens the airbrush needles. And the Sharpen Air, incidentally, is a tremendous great product that um, if you bend a needle, and needle for some of these high-end airbrushes is $30, $40 item, and you can um, sharpen them with this little Sharpen Air. So she said, Chad wants you to watch his video on sharpening, using his Sharpen Air, mm -hmm. and call him about the product, because we were gonna carry it in a catalog. 
So I watched uh, the video, and in it, Chad was painting, um, touching up a photograph. And so I, I watched it, and it looked cool and everything, so I called him up, and I said, I just watched your video on um, the sharpen air. He said, oh, which one did you watch? I said, the one where you were touching up a photo. And it was just silence on the phone for a little bit. And he said, I don't touch up photos. What are you kind of, what are you talking about? I said, yeah, you had a portrait of a whole family in this little thing and you were touching it up. And he said, that's an original. That's, I wasn't touching up anything. I was painting a photograph, copying a photograph. And when you looked, I mean, he's putting highlights on the guy, tips of the guy's ears that are this big. And so right away, I had to know, you know, what are you using for an airbrush? There again, it's gotta be the magic yeah. thing. What's the airbrush? He's uh -huh. using a Iwata Custom Micron. And I said, what are you doing for paint? Cause that's gotta be it, you know? And he said, there is only one paint for an airbrush artist. And he said, that's Createx. I said, I don't know anything about Createx. He said, you wanna talk to Craig Kennedy, the owner of Createx. So that's how we ever got to Createx Paints. Um, Craig set us up with Createx, um, gave us a whole lot of tips and hints and brought us to where we are today. We haven't used lacquer paints in the shop for three years, basically. Almost, yeah. We haven't run the exhaust fan unless somebody skins a skunk or something <laughs> like that. So, uh, but Createx Paints come in a little bottle like this. There's a couple different varieties. Um, there's there's um, Illustrator Colors. Yep. And um, they are already pre-mixed. You do not need to thin the illustrator colors very much at all. Yeah. And there's wicked colors. The illustrator colors, illustrator colors, um, they recommend don't thin them more than 10%. Yep. Um, that, that sometimes doesn't work as good for me because I like a more transparent color when dealing with okay. fish. Um, the wicked colors, you can, you can thin by a lot, a lot you know, yeah. like 50 to 75, 80 percent. But the first Wicked Colors we ever got out, they came out like peanut butter. And yeah, I thought, oh my thick. gosh, how are we going to make these work? So you shake them up really, really good. It works good to, we have these little pill containers. And when I go in the home, I'm going to get these babies for free. <laughs> I better get one a day. I think you get your ranch dressing in those too. You might get three. <laughs> um, now, you asked me for the red oxide, so I'm just going to take. You'll see. You'll see when I pour this out how thick it is. It's pretty thick. And I'm going to thin it. Um, when you when you are working with Createx, and you'll be all confused, just as we were when you get get started. Um, there's a 4011 reducer. There's a 4012. There's a 4013. There's a 4020. Mm -hmm. I miss any? Mm, not that I'm aware of, but probably. And uh, these are. I think formulated for the automotive industry, a lot of them, and uh, they, they have all different kinds of reasons for using different thinners. Some of them have a acetone, some of them have an alcohol base, some of them have a you know, different kind of base. Um, we've been using the 4011 and the, I think the 4013 works pretty good. One Very of them is for compliant us. in California, because in California you can't do anything can't out do there. Can't do anything. Um, <laughs> So they formulated one for California. It's called um, water. But <laughs> water, but it's gotta be treated water. Um, the 4011 works good for us. And I'm just gonna take, take a little bit of reducer, squirt it in here, and stir it up. Now, this is something that took us over a year to learn, correct? Um, this paint, though you think it's mixed very, very well, will not spray well or long until it's emulsified. And basically what that means is, um, Craig Kennedy says, let it sit for 10 minutes. Yep. And we find if we mix our paint 
couple hours before we're going to paint, mm -hmm. we have much, much, much better results. That paint, because it's thick, it just needs to soak up the pigment. And we just mix our paints like that and set them aside. You can shake them in there if you want to. And uh, when we paint fish, we paint from those little cups. It works real good. Yeah. Um, I guess some people some people mix their paints week in advance, um, yeah, or use them for some, a week, I yeah. should say. Um, we kind of do them on a daily basis. You yeah. know, we'll mix a little little paint like that. So, with all of that information that we fed you, um, now we're going to start painting the walleye. Mm -hmm. And uh, this will probably, we'll try to get as far as we can on a, maybe the next two sessions. Yeah. And um, there will probably be some painting going on behind the scenes that you don't see. But we'll show yeah. you um, just how we would start and, and how we would end. Um, the first thing you're going to want to do is make sure that you have something to go by. Um, if you think, you know, if your memory serves you that the, bottom of a jaw is white or gray or pearl or green or pink, um, have something to support it. You know, yeah. make sure that you know um, what, you're, what you're trying to do. Walleyes come in a lot of different colors and you can paint them any color you want, but it might not be what the customer got. Um, look at this, look at this walleye, it's Mark Kirkholm, and uh, look at that, that dark yellow ochre fish. That's a dark, dark golden fish. How's that? Um, and I'd say that's a northern Minnesota Canadian yeah, fish. Canadian. And uh, there's a lot of tannins in the water, I would say. But they, that's just a typical coloration compared to one of our local walleyes, which is I think they're beautiful, but some people would say not not as colored up. Um, so you're going to want to you, you want something like this, whether your customer gives it to you um, or you have a reference book. Um, keep good photos of what you're trying to accomplish. Mm -hmm. And with that, would you like to give them a little demonstration of how you would start and some tips on? Yeah, we can sure get started. Um, we have some paints over here that are pre-mixed. We mixed those, I don't know, an hour or so ago just to make sure that we had um, everything operating as best we can. We went through and hopefully cleaned our airbrush well. <laughs> um, and I think, I think there are just a couple of base steps that we'd like to get started with. And one of them is to blend your whites blend all your belly wipe, interior of the mouth, and cover some of those. And then also blend in your epoxy work. So any whatever colors your epoxies are currently, they need to match the skin. So um, we're not going to give you a paint schedule necessarily with uh, use this color and use that color, but we're going to tell you to create a color. This is probably a, this is a dark brown. Um, it may have a little bit of moss green in it. Um, that's going to blend into this surrounding color here. So we'll do both of those. I think we'll start with white because that's a, it's easier to go from your whites into your darker colors rather than from going from your darker colors to your lights. So I'm going to start with white. Mix it up, make sure it's good. It's always scary in case it doesn't spray. I know. What if it doesn't? I'll get mine ready quick. Yeah, you might have to. And we're going to take this and just spray the lower portion of the fish. We're going to spray everything from the epoxy work all the way down the belly. For some reason, I'm, there we go. Just going to open that up and spray. Leave my back handle off. Um, and I am just going to cover this bottom area. Kate, this is going to be hard. <laughs> <laughs> Want me to hold for you? Yeah. Um, I'll be your mounting stand. Oh, there we go. <laughs> you got it? Well, Are you in there? There we go. I might Good. need a foot more airbrush hose if I can pull that cart closer. There we go. 
Good? Yeah. So we're just going to start here on the bottom. And you can see all of this skin color on the lower jaw. We're just going to start blending in. And this is the time where you're going to see whether you're, what kind of job you did on your epoxy work. If your epoxy work is good, um, or if it's not, um, there's no harm in stopping right now if you see that you've got errors in your epoxy that you need to fix. So we'll come underneath like this, paint the whole bottom jaw. Um, I'll work mostly on this side so you guys can see it. Now I notice that you don't have a, a nozzle on the end of your, your little cap no, needle protector. I've got that off and I heard once from a very wise airbrush person that made the comment that if you read your instructions, which I thought I had, that they do say you can take that cap off. It's just a protective cap. So we've taken the, the little nozzle off and that's gonna keep it from developing paint buildup on the front. Um, spray inside the mouth um, really well. You can spray it fairly heavily. And um, let me just run through here. I'm gonna pull him back and, and then we'll flip him over and do the belly. Um, take the, take all of that skin, that dead skin color, and we're gonna bring it to a white. Now it might be a little bit unnaturally white at first, but um, we're going to make sure that how we get all of that sprayed through and nice and white. The camera shows that really well, how yellow the belly is and how white what yeah. you've done is. So we'll come in through here. Does that help you, Kate? And we're just gonna come back and really whiten this. Now, you'll want to be careful in your, the markings on the lower belly, and that's kind of a, that's a spot that can be very difficult to re recreate. Um, we will probably go about doing, we'll go about it and cover some of that up, and we'll show you how to recreate those markings, but you do want to be conscious of what's there. So I would do that nice and light to start. And I'm just gonna blend that belly white up into the fish, not too far, but we don't wanna have a streak there where it stops and starts. And I'm just gonna bring a little white down in here into the tail while it's in the airbrush, a little on the base of those fins. That's kind of it for the white start. Anything else? Did I miss anything? Mm -mm, good. Get myself trapped there. Um, I might put a little bit more inside the mouth. And just a little on the backside while it's in the airbrush. And in the mouth, it's hard to be real precise. You kind of just cover yeah. the yellow skin. Yeah, it, especially a closed mouth like this. Um, if you wanted to get very detailed in there, you would probably want to um, go about that a different way, which there's a lot of ways to do that. So um, I'm gonna just wash this out, pour out, pour back any excess into, into the little cup we had. I'm gonna spray through it. Um, these little pots are kind of nice to clean your airbrush into so you're not spraying all those fumes into the air. And then I'll clean it out quick with 4011. And do you have a paper towel? Oh yeah, we did right there. Perfect. Look at that. Thank you. Instant. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we'll just wipe it out of the reservoir. The next color I'm gonna to go to is a flesh color. It's kind of a dark, um, a little bit of a darker flesh, similar to that red oxide that you mixed for me a minute ago. Um, in fact, I could probably use that if that's well mixed. Um, any, you can go to any tone, and again, we don't necessarily have a paint schedule for you here, but, um, we're just gonna give you some ideas. 
Um, you can see this is a natural flesh color that has just a little bit of a warmer tone. Um, the illustration colors have several different, different uh, fleshes that you can choose to use. You can go really dark if you want to paint, if you want to paint like an orange color. Um, that works well. Mars red um, is a fun color. Burnt sienna is another fun color. Um, but I'm going to tone that back just a little bit using reference here. Um, I see a, this to be pretty fleshy. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. um, we'll use this You're pinky flesh at, tone. at flesh, fish well, flesh. Well, <laughs> this is, this is going to be the quick and dirty version, but um, we're going to paint this flesh really bright. And it's going to look like a clown but we will come back and tone it down. Um, I'm gonna spray it into the lowest portions of that epoxy detail. I'm gonna Stay spray it in there pretty as heavily. Bad as this looks, you're gonna be. <laughs> um, all of those little creases and nooks and crannies, um, low spots, I'm gonna put a little bit at the fin bases, um, a little at the vent. And a little at the base of the tail, um, up under, and then we will come back and tone that down. Now, Kate, get a good shot of that because this looks a little bit like Emerson. Emerson Sport <laughs> did this, I think, <laughs> with her um, 64 count box of Crayolas. The idea is that we're going to get a heavy amount of paint in the lowest part of the epoxy work or the lowest detail. Um, and then we're going to build it back. We're going to set it back. And if you look at your walleye reference, you'll notice that there's almost a whitish color on top of these. It's like a skin like, um, and I think that's where this idea kind of came from was we need to paint in layers and our lowest layers are the darkest and we'll start bringing forward some of the others. and. I hope there's Just, something on top. Of it. <laughs> we will cover it up <laughs> as best we can. Um, I'm going to use just a little drop of that red oxide before I go back to white, just to show them how crazy this can look. You know, the best part of this Createx is if you get it on your clothes, it comes out in the wash. You get it on your hands, it comes off the sink. Um, no thinners, no. Or if you get bad stuff, too much on your fish. What happens then? Can we get it off? For a little bit. <laughs> For a little bit. Hopefully soon enough. Um, I'm going to spray just a little bit of this red oxide just to have some difference kind of in the low areas there. And really make it look crazy. You should maybe make fishing lures the way you... <laughs> Make color. all this crazy stuff. Um, now I'm going to get rid of the rest of that red oxide. And since it was mixed with the flesh, I'm not going to put it back in the same cup. Um, but now I'm going to wipe it out. And we will go back over all of this with white. Now you could skip the depth and skip trying to um, set it back and create all of those layers and simply paint a very light coat of flesh on top of that if you'd like. Um, there's nothing wrong with doing that. You know, you ask, what if you get too much on your fish? Um, with any of the, the Createx colors, um, and it's kind of the same like, like a house painter. We painted our house a couple years ago, and I had a question for the painter, and he said, you know, it takes you know 26 or 28 days to cure that paint yeah. and I'm going what you know I never heard of such a thing um, it's the same with Createx because it's a water base that uh, it will you have a window of opportunity to get that paint yeah. off um, it will come off with water if you get it soon enough it will come off with any of the it'll come off with alcohol or any of the reducers if you get it soon enough but as yeah. time goes on, they call it a dry erase, I think. Yep. A little steel wool will take it right off. There's n nothing much holding that paint on 
because it hasn't solidified yet, even though it's dry to the touch. And, um, but when you take, uh, um, let it dry for a um, couple days, 48 hours, I think maybe, um, yeah. then it uh, gets harder and harder and yeah. harder. You're not gonna get it off. They say it'll make a chemical bond, yep. um, bond to the layers underneath. Um, so now I've just got white back in my airbrush and now I'm gonna angle spray, which we'll talk lots about, I'm sure, during the process of painting this. Um, but I'm gonna spray with being conscious of angles that protect the lowest part. And leave some of those really dark values down low. But I'm gonna cover up and create some depth on top. So if that makes any sense. That was like magic. Um, I'm gonna try to get some of that blended back. That went from like the worst under jaw <laughs> wall I had ever seen in my life to probably the best. Um, it goes pretty fast. It's an easy step and it creates a lot of depth and a lot of life. Um, I'll turn it for you here, Kate. Maybe you can get a different angle. Um, there you go. And so now you can see by, by protecting a few of those low spots, you can see where the paint stayed and the white didn't get quite as much coverage. And I'll back out here and I'll touch over just a little bit more of the, of the body side with the white. So that's one of the very first steps we'll do with about anything I like to anyways, mm -hmm. is build those flesh tones. And the, the step following that, um, would be to blend your epoxy work. Now you can do those in opposite order if you want to. Um, but like I say, it's kind of easier to go from white to brown than from brown to white. Um, just because uh, we want to get these colors to blend really well. So I'm going to clean this out. Um, I'm using a Q-tip. Tom. You want to tell them what? Tell them about the not to. <laughs> yeah. um, we have cleaned out our airbrush cups with the Q-tip for years, um, and there have been times when, of course, your airbrush doesn't work, and you work with it, and you clean it, and you spray thinner through it, you take the needle out, but nothing helped, and it wasn't, I think, until you showed me um, that the fuzz, the cotton fuzzes from the Q-tip can get balled up in the end of your yeah. fluid nozzle, and they're very, very difficult, difficult to get out. And you worked on my airbrush one time for, I'd say, 45 minutes before you finally pulled out several strands all balled yeah. up in a little tiny ball of cotton that was in the end of my airbrush. So don't be alarmed it's easily fixable but it may cause you problems yeah. um, by using a q-tip in the end of your or in your bowl because little fuzzes will get down in there and if they don't make it through your fluid yeah. nozzle um, they can get wound around and collect dried paint and i think yeah and then they're very hard to get out because if you think of a cotton archery target you can't hardly shoot an arrow through one and they won't um, go the through the way. hands so you got to yeah. kind of dig them out the back end yeah. Uh, sometimes you may be forced into a new fluid nozzle. Yeah. Um, so, but do as we say, not as we do on live. <laughs> um, but uh, no, if you're conscious of your Q-tips and conscious of the pieces and parts that get put through them, can I borrow your stir stick? Um, another thing, when it comes to uh, lacquers and waters, um, lacquers don't like waters and I think waters don't like lacquers. So using lacquers in your airbrush and then switching to waters, you may not have a pleasant experience. It may require a new fluid nozzle in here. Um, the needle you can always easily clean with um, steel wool, but it might take a new fluid nozzle and the vice versa. If you use waters, you wanna go back to lacquers, um, a lot of times they don't play well together. So you might need a new fluid nozzle. I am really struggling with my <laughs> cleaned up airbrush. 
Um, I might ask if I can borrow your C just so we can get these guys back. Oh, there we go. Get it? Mm, somewhat. Let me I must have page. had a little piece. There we go. Hmm. Give me a little I might bit borrow yours. This one? It? Yeah, there we that go. one. And now we're just going to use a color to blend. There you go. Blend our uh, top. And this is a color that we made that kind of matches. Ooh, that's nice. Um, matches the skin color on the top of the head. And if you look at your reference material, walleyes have a lot of definition up here. Right now, we're just going to try to get the base color. We're going to tint that epoxy and try and bring the epoxy to a surrounding color. But you can come in here and create all of those little dark variances now, too, if you wanted to. Wow, you saved me. <laughs> my, little, my little micron is not doing what I wanted it to do. There we go. And we would go through and and repair any other areas on the fish that have epoxy on them, such as there's a little hole that was at the back of a fin here. Um, this would be a good one to, if you had little fix-its, um, now's the time that we want to get those blended in. Um, very difficult to blend them in later on. So you want to kind of get those taken care of now. Do a little dust on the seam. Oops, there's our name. And that's really about it for. And that seam looks good enough to be a double sided fish. <laughs> well, those fish on fish forms fit pretty good. And like we said earlier um, in one of the sessions about skinning and double-sided fish and single-sided fish. Um, there's different ways when a customer comes in and they want to fish 360 degrees all the way around. Um, that can be a major undertaking and easily twice the price of a single-sided fish. Um, I always give them the option of a really well-crafted single-sided fish where you're going to cut him down the, the back or the dorsal or wherever. And um, this one, as you turn him around, that's a nice scene. Sure, this would be a great fish for exactly that. If somebody had a coffee table yeah. or a, a pose that was going to hold him away from the wall a little bit. Um, but I think that's about, that might be a good stopping good point for, for them. And uh, we can get back and I will promise to clean my airbrush better next time. Wow. That didn't that didn't execute quite how I wanted it to. It looks good. <laughs> well, he's, he's doing well. Um, these Createx paints paint so nicely when everything is flowing well. I intentionally cleaned my airbrush before my, my custom micron and thought, oh, this is gonna be great. And I bet I have just a tiny little piece of that. There it was, I could feel it. I got it now. Um, tiny little piece of Q-tip, just like we talked right in the end. I could feel it when I just pushed the, when I pushed the needle back through that it dislodged. And now it's painting pretty good again. Now to clean your airbrush after you use this, we'll take a little bit of, um, your reducer, I spray it into a paper towel or you can use your little jar, exhaust jar. Hold the tip and it's going to back flush back into the bowl. 
I spray it into the paper towel, open it up wide, make sure that it's spraying reducer really well, and then just wash out your bowl and it should be good. Occasionally I will pull the needle out and run it through a, a wet paper towel of one of the reducers. Um, we should tell them too, while you have it out, another product for cleaning um, that works really well, but we, but is not for soaking, but for cleaning these when they get dry, when you get dried up gunk, is that 4008 Restorer. 4008 Restorer, and anytime you get any of these new products, read the directions, <laughs> because we soaked our entire airbrush in these, uh, in the 4008, yep. uh, and... Uh, only to have difficulties, only to find out that it swells up O-rings. So yeah. it does, um, you can spray it through your airbrush, you can clean your airbrush, you can clean your bowl, you can do that sort of thing. Just don't soak your airbrush in it. Yep. Um, but that will take all that dried paint. If you have dry paint issues, you walked away from an airbrush that you didn't clean, sparkly clean, um, when you were done using it, that will clean it right up. That will clean. I should have showed them what this looked like beforehand, but cleans it right up nice. And what do we have for giveaway today? We are giving away a six-piece starter kit of Cortex oh. paints. Very I nice. Just tuned in. It looks like. <laughs> Did she? <laughs> Funny. And uh, they have to like and share, like and share, like and share. Yes. And the more times you like and share, the more tickets you get in the tumbler. Yeah. <laughs> and so did we already tumble them this week? Yeah, I think so. And we did. And the winner is? The winner is Tessa Messerly. Tessa, enjoy your Createx paint. Um, this will go out with your next order. Call us when you get it. Let okay. us walk you through. This is yeah. the best Thing that's ever happened I would say to painting in our shop but yes. it wasn't without a learning curve yes absolutely um, it's great great product you notice we have no fumes in here painting white on that yep. walleye um, typically we would have lacquer white haze yep. all over the place um, it's a great product um, it does take a little bit of getting used to but when you once you do you'll never go back yep and that's gonna come with looks like five primary colors and a reducer. So that'll get you going. And we do have a couple questions before we sure. sign off. We have Justin Baker and he is wondering on the bottle, it says ready to spray. Do you still recommend to thin the paint? Thanks. Depends on what you have. If it's mm -hmm. a, a illustration color, it's ready to spray. It's thicker than I like. Mm -hmm. They say, I, I just grew up with thin paint. Um, yeah. It's easier not to mess up with thinner paint for me. But uh, the illustration colors say, ready to paint. Um, they say, don't, don't thin them more than 10%, mm -hmm. and they spray good. Yeah. These, um, the wicked colors, are not ready. They might be ready to paint for some people, but they're thick but for they're me. Thick. I, yeah. I thin them a lot. You saw when I mixed this. Um, I put in a, just a puddle of paint, and I, it, I probably put in, thinned it by 100%. Yeah, quite a bit, quite a bit. So I do thin them. Um, yeah. The wicked colors lend themselves to reducing better than the illustration yes. colors. Yep. All right, and then we have Cole on YouTube, and Cole says that they have a fish in the freezer with a torn gill cover on the intended sh uh, show side. How would you go about repairing that? Ooh. I would dry it, yeah. like pose it with our thin carding stuff. Yeah. I would dry it. You're probably then going to have a crack of wherever the cut is on the gill yeah. flap. And then I think I would use maybe silk span on the backside. Yeah, that sounds and good. And then maybe then... Um, fix it sculpt or something on the show yeah. side. Yep. Yeah. And then just epoxy it so it's level, sure. retexture. Um, um, you can do might be. anything with a fish because um, it's not like feathers or fur. Yeah. Uh, it's it's a hard object, so you just copy the texture around there. Yeah. Awesome, and that is it. Are we good? We 
are good. Great. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. And we'll see you. I'm going to be gone next week, right? Oh, yeah. You will? I don't know what you got. You might as well just keep painting. I, we can keep painting. Uh, we'll see. I'm going to be diving for lobsters. Yes, you are for your birthday. For my birthday. Pretty exciting. Thanks.